We'll still see how far we get, and otherwise I'll just carry on next time, next week. So we made a one-factor model, and we found out it was a poor fit, and so normally you would then compare the AIC and the BEC, you would report out, and you would be able to say which one the better. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about measurement invariance. Have any of you ever heard of measurement invariance? No? So, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll see if I can post something, but I think it's just a matter of closing R and restarting it and out, because I think next, uh, and otherwise you need to have a quick look at Jonathan's code, because uh, we got it to run on, uh, on his. I think it's a matter of uh, not closing the sink. So, measurement invariance. Nobody of you have ever, has ever heard of uh, measurement invariance? No? So basically, we want to find out if the, we're consistently measuring the same thing in each group. So this was what I was talking about in terms of comparing cultures, for example, or comparing men versus women, or comparing groups of patients. We want to find out if the factor structure or this type of structure which we found is the same across different groups. And that's the, the point of, uh, of this. So, yeah, I've sort of given it away. So can you think of situations where it's useful? So you want to say, for example, if we're developing an intelligence test for nine-year-olds, you want to say, can I also use it for 12-year-olds? And that's, uh, that's just a... Uh, uh, or if, is it substantially different? So you want to see if your measure is usable for different groups or if it varies across those groups. A lot of texts, but there's basically four layers of measurement invariance. We can have equal form, so it means the number of factors and the pattern of factor indicator relationships is identical across groups. Yeah, So that's the most basic uh, thing. Then one step up is equal loadings. So not only uh, is the, the pattern the same, but the loadings are equal across those groups. Yeah? So it means that if we go to group A or group B, those arrows that we've drawn are the same type of strengths in group A as group B. Equal intercepts. So when uh, the observed scores are regressed on each uh, factor, the intercepts are equal across those groups. So basically it means that we don't have a group which is scoring substantially higher or lower, but basically that we also have a uh, equality in this, uh, in this domain. So you could, uh, that would be equal intercepts. And then if also our trash doesn't vary between those two groups, then we have strict measurement invariance. It basically means we're exactly measuring the same thing in group A as group B. Yeah. So group A and group B, their factor structure can differ in all sorts of different ways. The most basic one is the number of factors. Is it three in one group versus four in the other one? One step up is, are the loadings the same? The next step up is, is there a shift where one group, the loadings are the same, but one group consistently scores higher or lower than the other group? And then the final one is, we can, uh, 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 is the trash the same, so to speak? Are, we, uh, is there, are the patterns in the trash sort of the same? Yeah. So that means if we have that, it basically means we can apply without having to apply any type of transformation, the same type of intelligence test with the 10-year-olds as with the 12-year-olds. We're measuring the same thing. And if all four are satisfied, we have strict measurement invariance, and this does not always happen. In fact, it's quite rare to have that, because most of the time, you will have one of the lower uh, things. But we might already be quite happy with this. We might already be quite happy to establish that in Zimbabwe and Australia, we always find five factors for personality, or we always find the same type of construct for intelligence. That might already be quite good. And then we can work our way up for the other one, trying to make better measurements. So in our, uh, in our example, what we're going to try and do is compare the three-factor structure uh, in both, uh, both schools. So I told you that the data we have from these three latent factors are from three schools. And the question is, are you measuring the same in school one as in school two? So how do we do it? Now we have to, uh, I call it something differently. I call it a group model now, because we want to compare the groups. And we have to tell Lavan what the grouping variable is. So now I've done school, but in principle, you could also uh, compare boys, uh, boys course to girls course, or you can do it based on age, as with the intelligence example. And so again, this is the three factor model, which we had before, but I just renamed it to make everything cleaner. So in principle, you could have used the same one, but to make it cleaner, I call it group model one. And then fit CFA group, CFA, Group model one, the data is the data, and I tell it what the grouping variable is. It's as simple as that. 
Now, massive output, again, overload, and uh, this is what I should have shown you before. So the output will go, so this bit will go to the group CFA text, and so it's in between two, uh, two sinks. And if it's not in between two sinks, then things might go awry. So let's see if I can find uh, the uh, group. Okay. It will tell us now that we have two groups. We have a group called Pasteur and a group called Grant White, so two different schools. Yeah. What we then do is we get estimates for uh, for uh, we can get estimates split out for certain uh, for certain uh, for certain groups, but also for the overall model. Yeah. So it's printed the chi-square for each group, but for some of the uh, model-based statistics, it will have done it for the overall model. So it's uh, based on it being the same for uh, across those uh, two groups. So a whole bunch of, uh, uh, of uh, things in between. But what it will then do is it will print for group one and for group two. Those should be now, by now be familiar. So those factor loadings for the Pasteur school and for the Grant White school. Yeah. So we'll have done uh, those uh, separately. So we can then visualize them and then see if it looks very differently for group one than for group two. So this is for the Pasteur uh, school, and then for the Grant White school, you have the output below. So massive, massive output file again, drowning in data. But it's, uh, it's, uh, it's printed separately, which is what we wanted. So this is to check that it's recognized the groups are correctly, which is what we want. OK. Now, again, the visualization might help. This is quite busy, but this is with uh, the groups combined. So the only difference is, so these are, these are all the codes you have from before. I've called QGraph here, because sometimes it requires QGraph for doing some additional layouts. So if, uh, if you run into errors, then it's because Simplot is missing some component from QGraph. They're interrelated packages for drawing uh, things. Uh, if I picked the literal things, there would be less double-headed arrows. So uh, I'm not sure if I made one. Uh, no, I didn't make one with literal. So I did make one with Lizroll, but you can imagine. So it's printed those uh, those uh, things all out, but uh, with Lizroll you would get a somewhat cleaner output. So it's done those uh, those uh, things, and then what it's done is printed those for uh, uh, the group one and group uh, group two sort of the residuals on there. Yeah, but it's combined all the things into one uh, one graph. And what we're hoping now is that you find quite high loadings here. That would be uh, good. If you already find that there's not very high loadings, then the patterns might differ quite strongly between uh, between the groups. But perhaps more useful, uh, fortunately, it's, it's been uh, a little bit squashed. We can print it out for the Pasteur group and for the Grant group, White group separately, and then that would allow you to directly compare those arrows and see. We get 0.51 here. What do we get here? So you can then directly compare side to side what you're getting in one group versus the other group. Now, what we really care about is measurement invariance to see if it's uh, if it's uh, uh, different. So you remember those four steps? Those are the four steps that we saw that we see here as well. So we're going to test four different models of measurement invariance again, becoming progressively harder in terms of uh, so this requires that it's uh, it's exactly the same across bo both schools, and this is just the structure is the same, but they uh, they vary somewhat. Again, we, you can remember we can use our AIC and BEC to compare which ones are better. And you can't see here, but it will also print the RMCA and the CFI. You can use those to compare as well. I'll have an overview uh, later of those as well. So what we want is actually that we don't want it to become uh, significantly uh, worse. Yeah. So you can sort of see that fit configurable. We can improve if we go from fit configurable to fit loadings. Yeah. We go from zero. 7484 to 0480. We also improve in this, so we make some progress if we go into that direction. So it means we can favor the loadings model over the configural model, yeah, because we're going lower. And this is not significant, so it's not uh, that you build a significantly worse uh, model if you're going that way. Now, unfortunately for us, there it stops because if we go beyond the, uh, beyond the loading uh, model. So uh, then uh, it becomes worse. Yeah, you can see six units. You can also see here it becomes substantially worse. 
So in this case, you would settle on the loading sample as being the best in terms of measurement and variance. Yeah. So if we go back to this, it means that the factor loadings are equal across groups, but we can't say that uh, that both groups are equal and how they start high out high or low in those uh, scores, or that we're perfectly measuring the same thing because we have uh, issues with residuals. So the trash differs between, uh, simply put, the trash differs between school one and school two. Yeah? So this is the golden standard, but we are able to say, in both schools we get a three-factor solution, and in both schools we find that the factor loadings are roughly equal uh, across, uh, across groups. So the, the one arrow in group one is the same as the same other arrow in group two. Yeah? But that's loading, and it could still be uh, one group is systematically scoring higher or lower than the other group. So if Pasteur is a better or worse school, they would score higher or lower. The loadings would be the same to the latent construct, but one group would score higher or lower, which is the next step. Does that make sense in some, uh, some way? No? It's a lot to take in. So. If you want to phrase it differently, so model two is metric invariance. That's all in other terms. So response across groups attribute the same meaning to the construct under study. That's sort of the layman's interpretation. Model three is scale invariance. It means that the meaning of the construct and the levels of underlighting the items are equal across both uh, groups. And model four is means that the explained variance for every item is the same across every group. Put more strongly, the latent construct is measured identically in both groups. It measures that. That thing is measured exactly the same in Pasteur as in Grant White if we had model, uh, model 4. Yeah? So a lot of things to take in, but basically they tell you how robust your measure is if you take it from one group to another group and you measure the same thing. So suppose you're measuring burnout with anxious uh, patients and with depressed patients. You want to find out are they interpreting the questions in the same way? And uh, are we capturing the latent constructs in the same way? One group can score higher or lower. In that case, we would not satisfy scalar invariance. But if they score exactly the same and we uh, get exactly the same uh, structure, then we have strict measurement invariance. Yeah? We can again get a, a table from Stargazer to uh, uh, summarize our, uh, our outputs. Yeah, if you want to have fun for a day, so it took me a day, uh, I'm going to let, let you out. So, uh, it takes me also lots of time to figure out things. So if you want to have Greek symbols in your uh, in your table, that's not fun uh, uh, in Stargazer. So uh, I can show you in end how uh, how I did it. And if you do the exercise, I think I put in there how you uh, how you do it. But uh, Stargazer doesn't like uh, betas, and uh, you can write beta, but you can't have a Greek symbol uh, for beta, uh, apparently. So I found out the hard way. So uh, so here I use Stargazer. So what we do is. Uh, we use uh, side tabs to also help us build a measurement invariance table, which is uh, the tab.1. So we do MI for measurement invariance. That's our group model. So that will just store all the output that we just saw from uh, uh, all this output. That's the thing we want to capture. And then we want to make a table out of it. And then we uh, use side tabs to measurement environments table, and then MI, which is the object where everything is stored. Yeah. And then this, we tell Stargazer to use this uh, table. We don't want a summary because otherwise it will print the means and standard deviations, which we don't want. We wanted to make an HTML table, and then I wanted to relabel so it says chi square as in the Greek chi square, delta for delta, all sorts of other things, but it doesn't like that. So. I'll, uh, I'll show you later how to do that. But I can show you for now what it would look like. It's still not too bad. So it's done chi, but not what we want in terms of Greek symbols. Configurable metric scale or mean. So those four type of models. The degrees of freedom. Uh, it will also have done CFI and uh, delta CFI. And so that tells you how much worse you could. So the delta basically tells you. Do I get a lot? Do I get a more terrible model if I move from one to the other one? So you can see, if I go from this, it slightly is worsely, but it's not a whole lot better. So 0 0.92 to 0 0.921, that's not bad, but we go 
further down if we uh, move along do do those lines. Yeah, so that's only three decimals. This is quite a substantial shift. So we'd probably say this is fine. That's not that's not great. So basically, as you progress through this, you don't want to drop down and go to uh, to very low figures here because that means your fit is becoming worse and worse. Yeah, as you move from configurable to metric to scalar to mean. You want this value to stay close to what it was before. Yeah. And then we have the AIC and BEC. So here it's uh, or it's, here I've just printed the BEC, but you can also get the AIC if you want to. Uh, and it will print the D big is the delta uh, big. So you can say 26 uh, units, but in favor of this model, and then comes worse, and then way worse. Yeah. So six units. So that's why you would probably settle on this model based on BIC. Yeah, because you improve from this one, and then six six units worse is quite bad, and twenty four is out of the question. That's really really terrible. Yeah. Any questions? I think I'll uh, see how much more I have, but I think we can. I the next bits are just uh, sort of how you would summarize this, and we're getting close uh, to the end. Just the explanation of the exercise. So. It's a lot of text, but the best fitting model were both on AIC and BEC was one with metric invariance. So that's that second uh, second one, yeah. In terms of RMCA, the model, do you say which one is the absolute best fitting model, and then you say how much worse it it becomes with the difference between metric invariance model. So C5 favored this configurable model. So you remember 0 0.93, 0 0.921. So 0 0.923 is the best model. But it doesn't become a whole lot worse if we go to 0.921. Uh, and uh, while the metric, and then you also want to describe something in absolute terms. Is it a good model in terms of absolute terms or not? And so, while the metric uh, metric invariance is not a good fit because it's 0.09, ideally want to be close to 0.05, 0 0.06, 0 0.07. But it is in CFI. 0.92 is a very is quite a good model in terms of uh, fit. And then you can also just still discuss the delta CFI, delta RMSA, and you can see how much worse the fit becomes if you move from one to the next model. So lots of uh, lots of uh, text and lots of uh, measurement things. So most of the time, people this is how they report it. So it is lots of different indices, and then the reader has to make up his or her own, own mind. And so in conclusion, in this case, we have metric invariance, and it means that the meaning of the latent constructs is the same across Pasteur school and Grant White school. It doesn't mean we can take the same test from Pasteur to Grant White because and, uh, inevitably one will score higher or lower and the trash is not the same, but it means that the, the, the kids are understanding the questions in the same way as in school one as in school two. And it also means that we recover in both the three factor structure. I think that's uh, all I wanted to say. The rest you can see on the slides, and then uh, it has an exercise. And that's uh, that's this. All I want to say with partial variance is that sometimes you can't get it to work, and it's just one or two items. And if only you could fix those one and two items, everything would work perfectly. And then you would speak of partial variance. You would say, for those two, we're going to allow them to vary between those two groups. So they, one group can score higher on this one or this one, and then we would have partial invariance. Any questions? No? Good luck with your assignments, and then uh, I'll see you next week for the uh, next bit on structural equation modeling, and keep at it with the exercises also. And then uh, any questions, put them in our uh, blackboards. I will not answer any questions on Friday, and I think Thursday around 4 p.m. would be the latest one, which I would check, so don't leave it really, uh, really late. I won't do any nighttime checking. Uh, I hope you understand. Okay. Yes. Well, is that all for working directly? Yes. Well, uh, where I can see all the files you have, uh, and so you will it will have to you, you would have it print output to some things, and I just want to make sure that it's uh, that it's there. Right. Okay. That's uh, so it's your working directly. Yeah. Not like I, I think one of you understood this. I want a screenshot of everything in between. No, just oh. one single screenshot of the overall thing. Will do. If you haven't signed uh, sheets, make sure you sign a sheet. You don't need a screenshot of all of the uh, code.
No, no, just a, a screen because you'll upload your art code as the .rmd, so you'll upload that. So I don't need a screenshot of that. I just need a screenshot to see that it's printed all the output to your uh, working directory. It's to make sure that 